experiencing Jesus, the living God, he who never fails, the one who gave life. He who draws us together, the human spirit, his treasured creation, his presence within us. The human condition is designed to experience and to be moved by its creator. He longs to know us, and so he pursues, so that we, his children, may experience God. Welcome back to Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God. Before we continue with this study for the week, I want us to go back and I want us to review what we've learned so far. First of all, we have learned that God is always at work around us. Wherever you and I go, God is at work. Secondly, we've learned that God pursues a love relationship with us that is both real and and personal. Number three, we've learned that God invites us to become involved with Him where He's at work, and He does that through the love relationship that He has established with us. Number four, we've learned that God speaks to us today by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, through prayer, through circumstances, and through the church to reveal Himself, His purposes, and his ways. Number five, we learned last week that God, uh, when he invites us to become involved with him, it causes a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. And what we have learning this week, we're learning that that crisis of belief causes a point in our life where we need to make major adjustments in order to follow God and to obey Him and to do His work. Now, as we're looking through this, we see that God does this over and over as we see how He's worked through people in the Bible, how He's worked through the person of Moses, how He worked through Abraham. We've looked and saw how He works through other people. Way back in... Uh, Week four, we saw how God used one man by the name of Peter and what God began to do in his life. And so in order, to, uh, in order for us to look at this week's subject, I want us to go back and I want us to see how each one of these principles was at work in the life of Peter. And again, it's not the principles, it's not a formula, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what Peter had. What was God doing when God called Peter, when Jesus called Peter beside the Sea of Galilee, what was God already at work doing? Well, we know from God's word that God was at work through sending his son Jesus to come into this world and to redeem a people for himself, to save the world. John three sixteen and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Then we see that in verse 17 that God did not his send his son into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus Christ. And so what God was already at work doing when he was calling Peter was Jesus was on this earth. He was calling people to follow him. He said in verse 17 of Matthew 4, Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So God was at work around Peter. We also know that God had already established a relationship with Peter. Jesus had already met him. Andrew, the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 40 through 42, that Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, introduced Simon Peter to Jesus. 
And so they developed this relationship, and Jesus knew Peter's name. Jesus knew Peter, and I'm sure it just blew Peter's mind. He says, you are Simon, son of John, but you are no longer going to be going to call that, but I'm going to call you Cephas, or Cephas, which means rock, which we get the word Peter. Peter is Petros, Greek for rock. And so Jesus gives Peter this nickname, that you are the rock. And he says later on uh, to Peter, he says, on this rock, I will build my church. So Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, gates of heaven. I'm going to give you this, this ability to establish my church on this, on this earth. And so he begins this relationship with Peter and he gives him a nickname, calls him the rock, calls him Peter. We also know that Jesus um, invites Peter to become at work with him in what he was doing. Again, Jesus has said that, it, that his, his job on this earth was to preach and to saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he comes to Peter, and not just Peter, but he also comes to Andrew and James and John. And the word of God talks about this in Matthew chapter 4. And so he calls Peter as well as Andrew, James, and John, to himself to be at work where he's at work. And the Bible says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And so Peter gets this call to follow Jesus. And this call to follow Jesus comes with a crisis of belief. So in the life of Peter, Peter has to trust that Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus is who he really uh, was proclaimed to be. In John chapter 1, it says that when John the Baptist saw Jesus, his disciples around him, which some of John's disciples were also Jesus' disciples, and he says about Jesus as he's walking by, he says to his disciples, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So Peter had at this moment, when God calls him, when Jesus calls him to follow him, he has to make the decision. Am I going to believe that Jesus is who he is? Is he the Lamb of God? Is he the Messiah? Is he who he says he is? And will he do what he says he will do? Because it says in Mark uh, chapter 1 that Jesus tells Peter, he says, Follow me and I will make you to become fish, fishers of men, a fisher of men. I will make you to become this. So he had to trust that Jesus was going to do what he said he was going to do. And it comes to this, that Peter has that decision that he needs to make. Is, is he going to stay where, is he, where he is? Is he going to stay being a fisherman? Is he going to stay doing the same old thing day in, day out? Or is he going to leave everything and follow Jesus? So there needed to be a major adjustment in Peter's life. Peter could not remain a fisherman of fish and go with Jesus on this mission, on this ministry, on this uh, call to follow him to be fishers of men. So he, there had to be a major adjustment in Peter's life. He could not stay where he was, what he was doing, and go with God. And so it is with us. And so it is with you. And so it is with me. You and I, as followers of Jesus, we cannot stay where we are and follow God. There are so many people who want to take Jesus as their Savior, who wants to follow Him in Him being the Savior, their ticket out of going to hell, and their ticket to going into heaven. But they don't want to have anything to do with Jesus being the Lord of their life. You see, we can't just take Jesus and pick and choose from Him what we want. It's either we take all of him and who he intends to be in our life, what he wants to do in our life, or either take him for who he is or, or don't take him at all. Because we can't pick and choose from Jesus what we like as if he's some sort of buffet. we got to understand that Jesus calls us to make a calculated and very deliberate 
adjustment to follow him as the Lord of our lives. I want you to listen to how serious Jesus is about the cost of following him. And this is massive, loved ones. I want you to understand this is massive. We, we can't just pick and choose. We can't just, just take what we want from Jesus and leave the rest. I want you to understand that this is vital for what it really means to be a Christian. And what it really means to follow Jesus with everything. Listen to the, to the seriousness. Listen to the, the, to the uh, massive uh, seriousness that Jesus has to say to us and to those who would follow him. It says to here in Mark chapter 8, And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous, sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And then in Matthew chapter 10, uh, it says this, Jesus continues and he says, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Verse 38 of Matthew chapter 10, And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So in order to follow Jesus, in order to obey Him, there must be major adjustments that are made in our lives. We can't stay where we are and go with God. So Jesus' message at the very beginning, and His message still today to us is this, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew four seventeen. The word repent means to turn from the way that you're going. And so the word repent tells us we can't go the way that we're going, being on our agenda, doing the things that we want to do, being our own captain of our own souls, doing what we want to do in our life and go with God. We must turn around. And Jesus said, if you want to be a part of me and my kingdom, you need to make that adjustment. You need to turn from where you're going, living life your own way, and you need to turn and follow me into my kingdom. No longer can you be the one who calls the shots. I must be the king of your life. And this happens initially when we get saved. This happens initially when we come to Christ. But it happens consistently, constantly through our lives. Every single day of our life and with every assignment that God gives us, He is calling us to make major adjustments. You see, what it means to be a follower of Jesus is a radical change that we have come to where we have a life that's oriented into Him and His kingdom. He is our King. His principles and His life and His will must become our will. And so there's a major adjustment that happens when you come to follow Jesus. And there's major adjustment that needs to happen when God calls you to every assignment that He's calling you to. So it's not just one and done. It's constantly God calling us to make major adjustments, a degree here, a turn there, in order to follow God with where he's going, what he's doing. And that's what he did in, Matt, in, in Peter's life. That's what he did with all the disciples' lives. That's what he did with, with everyone who follows God and his will. There's major adjustments. So God uh, calls Peter. Jesus calls him to himself, has that relationship with him. Peter takes Jesus at his word. He believes that Jesus is who he says he is, and he believes that he will do what he says he's going to do. And so he makes that adjustment. He leaves his nets. He leaves his boat. He leaves the Sea of Galilee. He leaves being a fisherman of fish, and he becomes a fisher of men. Now, what a difference that made in Peter's life. What a difference happened because Peter was willing and did make the adjustments 
in order to follow Jesus and to become his disciple. He was able to see Jesus do miraculous things. Because Peter followed Christ and he made those adjustments, he saw miracle after miracle. He saw blind people see again. He saw people who were lame for all of their life, never walked a day of their life. They stood on strong legs and began to to, to walk around and run and leap. Peter got to see dead people who were in graves for four days, like Lazarus, come to life again. If he would have stayed by the Sea of Galilee, he would have never saw all of those things. Peter was eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, he denied that he even knew Jesus, but Christ forgave him and even gave the word to the angel. He says, go tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus is alive. And then he goes before them. So Peter gets to see Jesus alive after the resurrection. He gets to see 3,000 plus people come to know Christ when he preaches his first sermon. All of these things and so much more that I could just go on and on about how Peter saw God do amazing things. Peter got to see that because of the adjustment that he made in Jesus when Jesus called him. So I think initially it had to have been tough for Peter. It had to initially be a very difficult thing because when Jesus calls him to follow him, to leave everything, to leave the fishing, to leave the nets and follow him, initially it had to be tough. He left something that he'd always done. He probably learned fishing from his father and his father's father. He, he initially probably had a very difficult decision to make. And it was something that he had to wrestle with. And may, maybe for uh, however long it took him to put through his mind before he followed Jesus. He had to leave his wife. We know that he was married. The Bible says he had a mother-in-law. And he left his wife and he left his family for days, weeks, months on end in order to follow Jesus from town to town and be in that personal relationship with Christ and to be on mission with Jesus. He had to leave everything he'd ever known. He had to initially think about, I don't, I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. Every, every, every day that he would get up as a fisherman, he knew exactly what he was going to do that day. He knew that night he was going to go fishing. And then he knew during the morning he would make everything uh, repaired so in order for him to do the same thing. But now that he's following Jesus, he goes, he must have been going, I, I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. But was it worth it? Absolutely. What a difference it made in his life. How, how could Peter, and I'm going to read this, how could Peter measure what was given in exchange for making the adjustments to follow Jesus Christ? It, it's measureless. What he got in return for making that adjustment, what he got to see, what he got to experience, what he got to be able to eyewitness paled in comparison to the life that he would have lived if he hadn't made that adjustment. If he hadn't made that adjustment, what would Peter's life been like? Just an ordinary fisherman catching smelly fish all day. But because he made that adjustment, because he obeyed Jesus, he experienced God. He experienced God do amazing things in his life and through his life. And loved ones, we could stay where we are and we could think that where we are and the life that we're living we can think it precious all that we want to. But when Jesus calls us to follow him, he has got so much more than what we would uh, live and have an ordinary life without that. It, following Jesus is so much better. And following his will is so much more exciting. And you get to experience him compared to just living a life. Listen, when you follow Jesus and you experience him, Everything else pales in comparison. What you thought you were giving up was really not a sacrifice because you got so much more. You get so much more when you follow Jesus. And so the adjustments that you and I make, yes, there's a sacrifice. Yes, there is trust. There is that faith that requires action, but it's worth it. And so if God's calling you to an assignment, 
You can't stay where you are and go with that assignment. You can't stay how you are and go with God. He requires us to count the cost, but the cost is so much worth it. Sometimes we need to think about counting the cost in both directions. What will it cost you if you disobey Christ? What will it cost you in the experience of knowing Jesus more? What will it cost you? What will it cost others in the eternal perspective, in the salvation of others, if you and I reject Christ and His call and reject making those adjustments? Then we think that following Jesus costs a lot. And it's a sacrifice. But what would you be sacrificing if you told Jesus no? Can I pray for you? Father, I pray that we would count the cost. I pray that if there are somebody, there is somebody watching right now who is considering, thinking about following Jesus and becoming a Christian, that they would count the cost. It's not just about getting into heaven. It's not just about escaping hell. Becoming a follower of Jesus means that we follow you. We follow you as our king. We follow you into your kingdom. We follow you and you change our lives. So I pray that we, as God's people, would be very clear with those who need to come to Christ. The cost of following Jesus. But we'd be also very truthful to our own selves. God, help us to know that there is a cost. There is adjustment that needs to be made when we follow you. But there's also a cost if we say no. If somebody does not trust you as Savior, Lord, we know that the cost is eternal separation from you in hell. What a cost to say no to Jesus. But we also know as Christians there's a cost if we disobey you. We don't get to experience you. We don't get to experience you at work through us. We miss out on seeing you do God-sized things as a church if we as a church disobey you. So God, I pray that you would show us that the adjustments, though they be costly, they're worth it all. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hope you have a great time in your study groups. Hope you have a great time this next week as you go and you study, continuing in your uh, pursuit of experiencing God. And may God bless you and let Him let you know how much you are loved by Him. And I pray that God will let you know how precious it is to obey Him and to trust Him. And that by doing that, you will and I will experience God. May God bless you.